John Hanning speaking. That is what is recorded in the history. The whole year that Kawaka just met one, the year that is made white man. <laughs> seconds a child is dying of malaria in Africa now to get the dose of life-saving uh, um, anti-malaria is about five dollars but there's no government to give anti anti-malaria uh, when somebody gets malaria if they have no money they get ill and die so my quest the question that I was asking and many people were asking was if you really want to help children why begin with a disease that they don't have? Why, why not go home? Why not look for something that is killing them? This is, this is Ox Oxford, Cambridge, where you go to get this degree where you get the first degree, which is a, a, a BA, bachelor's degree. You know, they don't believe in marriage. So they don't, you know, the only thing they can give you is a bachelor's degree, you know? So, so, because you can stumble on a conference like this and get shocked when a few ideas are thrown in your head. I don't believe what Nana Sekhmet said. I don't believe that kind of stuff. It's okay, you know. They teach you how to critique, not to believe anything. You know, when they say, when they, when, when they, they say, uh, what do you think about black people building their own institutions? You say, well, is it has its own advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> um, the high culture of Egyptian civilization that starts around the Nile Valley eventually ends up here in the Giza Plateau, in the pyramids of Giza, one of the highest high technical civilizations that African people put together. Starting all the way from Uganda, covering present day Sudan, and going up here in Egypt.
established that more than seven million years ago, a black woman stretched forth her hands under God and gave us the first human being. In the beginning was a black woman. This black woman lived at the foothills of the mountains of the moon. This black woman lived in the Idracostin region known in ancient time as the land of the gods. This black woman lived at the source of the Nile. This black woman lived between the two domes of the Great Rift Valley. This black woman's genes run through the genes of every human being. This black woman's DNA is the string that connects every person that walks on earth. That is why we say that let him that is worthy be worthy still, and let him that is righteous be righteous still. So behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give unto every man and woman for and according to his reward should be. For in the beginning was a black woman. This woman gave rise to a human. Never was a time when a black woman was not. Never will be time when black people will cease to be. Because we are eternal, my brothers and sisters. Professor Kihura in Kuba, welcome to TV Africa. And I think TV Africa feels honored to, to have the privilege of interviewing someone as, um, if I could say so, dynamic and prolific as you. Well known in the community and um, increasingly so in the international Pan-African community. First I'd like to ask you, where were you born? Tell us about your, your childhood. Well, um, a lot of people um, have been interested in that question. <laughs> I don't really know whether I can uh, ably, you know, answer it. Uh, mm. There's been a lot of mythology now surrounding Well, you have now the opportunity of removing all the mythology and giving us the facts, as you remember. I was born on the equator, you know, where the world is dissected into two equal halves. In fact, mm. when I was young, we used to sing that uh, you know the village where I was born called Chigoma was uh, the middle of the earth and at the time I didn't know what they meant but uh, later on I came to realize that that imaginary line called the equator really dissects the whole earth uh, mm -hmm. uh, into two equal halves. Uh, I was also born at the foothills of the mountains of the moon. Uh, well. The mountains of the moon being Mount Kenya. Mount Sounds Kenya. very romantic. Yes, put it right. the mountains of the moon in what was called then the land of the gods. And it was called the land of the gods. Um, Where does that phrase come from? Yeah. Where does that come from? The what mythology or...? It is from ancient Egypt. Okay. But the, the remnants of the whole um, of that language uh, remained with the population and also the geography and the history remained mm. with the population uh, and it has, uh, you know, main, they have maintained that up to today. So they still call it the land of the gods. And I remember uh, hills and forests and mountains and, and it was beautiful. And the in interesting thing was at the time, we thought that the world was really our village. There was mm. nothing else. Absolutely. Uh, we could see cars passing by the road. We lived near a, a, a main road. We could see cars passing, but nobody cared. We didn't think that those people were going anywhere other than our village. And we thought mm. our parents were the richest people on earth. You know, mm. we never wanted anything. You know? Isn't that what all children think wherever they are? No, no. Yeah? no they, they, they think their the father is the strongest. They see a swimming pool and they come home and say, you know, we have seen a swimming pool. You know, I've seen these people with a big TV. Mm. But for us, there was no television. So um, your father's house and your father's kitchen and your mother's, uh, you know, banana plantation was the be most beautiful. So there was nothing else, um, you know, that uh, you know that uh, you felt inferior or you felt in a certain way. No, it was uh, it was totally beautiful. And then I remember 
uh, of course, several incidents. One of the things that we did was to run to catch grasshoppers. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 an alarm would be made on a hill in the morning. And we would all you know, power out of the house, so, so. holding carabashes, going to catch them grasshoppers. And it was nice. It was like one of the most beautiful day out. And uh, undoubtedly, there were poems that were composed you know, of uh, grasshoppers, and uh, one of them went like this, huh? And people would say, mm. 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 Now, that was the joy, you know, the beauty, the, 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 the incredible, idea, idealistic, uh, more than romantic, mm -hmm. almost indescribable environment that we grew up in. Mm. Then, you know, there was the banana boat. The making of juice out of bananas. Mm. You wake up in the, in the morning, it's about five o'clock, and everybody has gone, and then you follow that footpath, it takes you in the middle of the banana plantation, and there is a huge trough made out of wood, you know, carved, you know, uh, just like they make wine in, in uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, the, and then you have to be getting these melanated bananas and taking them out of the skin and putting them in the boat. And there'd be all people, your neighbors, and they're seated on the boat and they're talking and they're excited. And they're I, 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 I want to oh, know a bit. I want to know. Go back to that period. Well, we, who knows? We, in our next life, we may be able to. I want to know about your mother. What was your relationship like with your mother? My mother was strong. Woman. My mother could outrun a cow. Even now, she's about 105. Wow. She can outrun a cow and put it down with with her her her, her arm, her left arm. Wow. You know, she impressive. She could carry a huge pot of water and gracefully walk up the hill. You know, she she always had money on her. I don't know where she got it from. Mm. But she always <laughs> had money. So when your father gave you money for fees and you know you going away and and you think it's not enough then she would follow you you know she would like uh, you know accompany you to you know the main road and then she would slip something in your arm and you know she was very inventive and very ingenious and she could learn skills you know very quickly and she was very re well respected she was also a you know, very outspoken uh, uh, you know outspoken woman you know she was she was totally unbelievable. Was she very loving towards you, to you? You see, the, the, the concept of love uh, <clears throat> is now all misplaced. Mm. The, the people talk about love. Love is mutual commitment to each other's happiness, development, and well-being. Mm. It was not bondage of the heart. You know, they didn't babysit us. Yes. They didn't, uh, you know... Did she breastfeed you? Breast oh yeah, uh, that's bonding. That's bonding. When you talked about my bath, most people say mm. that I. Uh, the actual story was when my mother was pregnant. She got she she, and, and uh, during her due time, she had gone to to collect fire, and then she gave birth to me, and when she gave birth to me, she no, it started raining, and she took shelter in a big cave mm. uh, to shelter from rain, and then she gave birth to me. And when she gave birth to me, she passed out. And for three days, you know, she's, uh, she's out there on her own with me. Uh, so they sent out a party to look for us. And they discovered us after three days. And it is said that I was really there, seated, uh, you know, just stroking my mother. <laughs> no, uh, you know, so that story has been uh, added on a lot of times. A lot know, of mythology behind that. By leopards and, yes. and uh, lions and, uh, you know, but that's okay. I mean, if a leopard guarded me, that's good. You know? That's wonderful. You know, that's, uh, and that's why they called me the name Kiran Kuba. That's why the name Kiran Kuba. It's, it's, uh, it, it means that the, it's like lightning that gave birth to me because I was born, you know, during the time of uh, thunder and lightning. 
Well, most impressive. Now I want to hear about your father. My father was one of the most incredible men you could have met. He was tall and strong, blessed of the sun. He was very hard working. He could, uh, he could get in a, he worked 24 hours. Uh, he never had any time to sleep. He, <clears throat> he would get into the field and plow like a tractor. Uh, he would carry he heavy loads. He would, um, he would, he was very tough. He, he never gave you a chance to explain. If you wanted something done, you'd have to do it. Uh, and if you hesitated and he was holding a very big uh, stick, he would throw it at you. So mm. as a young child, I learned the African technique of martial arts, you know, like ducking from... <laughs> from, you know, from, from your stick, father's sticks. From my father's <laughs> But at night, we would sit all by the fire and listen to all these amazing stories. And then he would also tell us about his life. Uh, for mm. example, uh, my father was also a preacher. You know, he, he, he was one of those who brought uh, uh, you know, Christianity into our area and consolidated it. And uh, he used to tell us all these stories of what would happen and what happened. And he never told us why he left, because he was like a preacher for 28 years. Which denomination? Uh, Catholic. You know, okay. Catholic. He was a Catholic preacher. So one time, uh, he told us this story. When he retired, he was given a vest, a vest, you know, mm. a sweater. No, not a, a sweater. You know, it was marked color. Mm. Twenty-eight years after serving God in a church. What a wonderful gift to 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 get. Yeah, absolutely rich, uh, uh, institution. Job. Yes. Uh, the best thing they could give him was a sweater. Mm. But the reason he retired was one day he was traveling from uh, from uh, Kasese you know, to, to, you know, to Mbarara. And they were on a motorcycle with this Canadian priest. You know, I believe mm. he was called some name like Pere Budwa or Pere means, uh, you know, father. Mm. And then a lion chased them in the national park because you pass through the Rwenzori National Park. When a lion chased them, this white man panicked. And as he panics, he fell down. Now, when he fell down, the lion kept coming closer. And so he says to my father, that Jesus had said to him that uh, he should be eaten by the lion because he as a Catholic priest uh, and a white man was in a better position to spread the word of God and, uh, and whereas if my father was eaten by a lion then he would go to heaven so my father said who told you this and he said uh, you know it's Jesus so my father said well if Jesus knew that I was the one to be eaten, how come he didn't speak to me first? <laughs> and no. since he had made that uh, mistake in communication, <laughs> he, we shall let the lion do the choosing. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> so, wise word. <laughs> so the lion came and uh, I think it looked at both men. He was used to eating black people. And, and so he says, I think I would like to try my life with this Canadian. You know? <laughs> So, so it started devouring the Canadian, but my father being a very strong man, and not, uh, not without fear at all, mm. um, he held the motorcycle and chased the lion away, but it had gorged off the feet of, you know, of this man. Mm. And uh, from that time, he, he really kept it a, a close distance you know, from, uh, you know, from the institution you know, of the church, because he believed that uh, uh, you know, they were giving a message that was not, not good. Not not good. How did you how did you get into the Catholic um, seminary? That was supposed to be that was my uh, the path that my father had marked out for me and my mother. Mm. They were both very strong Catholics, and mm. uh, despite the fact that my father used to tell us stories around the ch the, the, the village, uh, the village fire. Uh, you know how when they started, you know, bringing religion to elders, and elders would say, "Okay." This God, uh, where does he live? And my father would say, I really don't know. I don't know. He does. Then he said, well, if you don't know where he lives and he's talking to you every day, how, where do, do you receive this communication from? Because you know? every time you talk to us, you say it is the word of God and you don't even know <laughs> where he lives. Yes, you know? Then he says he lives in heaven. Then he said, well, where, where is heaven? And then my father would point to the sky. 
And then they say, well, and there are people there in the sky, they should be God for the heaven and God for the earth. So people would ask him like every day, average question, you know, like, why doesn't he have a wife? I mean, how does he get a child? And then they say, well, he has, a, he has no wife, but he has a son. Then they say, well, he had a, a son out of wedlock. You know? Then he didn't pay bride well. <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh, you know, so you know, those kind of stories. But still, they wanted me to be a Catholic priest because, mm. you know, a priest would, uh, you know, drive a Volkswagen, a priest would have a nice office, you know, he builds his own office, you know, mm. the mm. church, and next to it, he builds where he sits. A priest doesn't really have to work very hard for food because, you know, people bring the, you know, offerings and the offertory. And then it was also a prestigious job, and then the education was good. Mm. So, as a young person, I qualified to, um, you know, to go in a preparatory school, which was a Catholic, you know, seminary, and uh, you know, the education was good, and went on to, you know, a higher level, you know, of, uh, you know, seminary life. The preparatory seminary was horrible because I had to leave my home, I had to leave my village, mm. uh, I had to leave everything that I knew and then go and join all these kids in boarding schools and be there without support. Uh, we have to wake up early morning, bathe cold water and uh, you know eat very little food and it was very difficult. It was very difficult. So we go to the preparatory seminary and then from the preparatory seminary we went to higher level. The preparatory seminary the students were okay. We, are, we were all very young. And uh, I remember um, none of us had ever lived in, you know, in that kind of environment and you had the students who are coming with the... That's when I knew that my father was not as extremely rich as we thought because mm -hmm. I saw other kids being brought to the school in a car. I saw them with big mattresses and in big suitcases. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had a small wooden suitcase. And, uh, you know, so I started thinking maybe mm. you know our village is not the richest and uh, i also discovered that our village was not the end of the world you know as as we thought and then higher on in a, a, a minor seminary i found the most wicked place the priests were wicked the students were wicked you know they they were teasing they were beating you they were and then the priests you know they 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 had girlfriends and and they uh, slept with so many of them and they had even beds in their offices, you know, where they would have their girlfriends and sleep with the girlfriends even in their offices. These these are Catholic priests you're yes, talking and, about. Uh, you know, me not coming from a family that had a lot of money, as I thought, one of the things that I did was to, you know, sell alcohol to them. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I Enterprising. Ran, I ran, I would make, uh, from banana juice, I'd make uh, waraji. And mm. I put it in a jerry can and supply it to the priests. Which also was one of the reasons why they chased me away because when they owed me a lot of money, then they found they could get rid of their problem by just driving me away. But at the same time, I was very strong rebuilt, I was a very strong person, uh, and I knew how to fight. You know, so we reached a stage where nobody could beat us. Mm. You know, and everybody started collecting around me. And then they called me Bayete, which is the name they used to call Shaka Zulu because I was a, a protector of uh, all, all the kids that had been, uh, you know, chased away, that had been intimidated, you know, by older boys. Uh, but significantly, uh, if most of these students had the problems to resolve, they would go to a witch doctor. They didn't go to a priest or a director, no. They go to witch doctor. These are seminarians. <laughs> so, 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 so imagine, you can imagine the type of place that it was. And then again, um, <clears throat> at the same time, we had a lot of questions that could not be answered. You know, when we went into the Bible and started asking about the penetrating question, like why does God kill the firstborn children of the Egyptians when he could easily have killed the Pharaoh um, and save the children? Why does God, you know, send his son to be sacrificed? To who? He is God. So why are you sending your son to sacrifice your son to yourself? You know, uh, why did Paul write all these letters and forget to write to, you know, the Africans? Is that why you left the seminary? That was, uh, you know, part of the reason that we left the seminary because we are raising questions that they couldn't answer. Uh, and, uh, and the questions became more and more and more insistent. And, uh, you know, it, it became incompatible with uh, what we are, you know, preparing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. until you know, that stage when, you know, I left, you know, I left the Catholic, you know, seminary 
and, mm. that, uh, and the Catholic institutions. I left more with questions than I had got in you know, because I had come in with uh, you know this whole concept of you know of God the Father and God the Son and you know God the Holy Spirit and heaven and mm. earth and hell. But then I saw priests living in heaven and I saw you know kids living in hell. I saw all here on earth. I saw hell on earth and I saw heaven on earth at the same time. And then I, I saw questions which couldn't be answered by the Bible and that became a little bit difficult for me. So from there you came into the, came into to the city, busy Kampala. city Kampala. Because I couldn't get a place uh, to, to, you know, to study hmm. in, uh, in, uh, in the villages. What did you do in Kampala? Um, I went in a place called Nsova. First of all, when I came from Kampala, I went and lived with my uh, brother-in-law. And uh, I had come with a lot of food, so the brother-in-law... You're was most welcome. Most welcome <laughs> to me. As soon as he finished the food, he chased me out of his one bedroom. And uh, at night, in the middle of the night, in Nsova. And Nsova was a very dangerous place in, in, uh, in uh, Cheba and Donau. So I went and knocked on somebody's door and he couldn't let me in, but he asked me to go at the back of, of the shop. Um, in the morning, I did a deal with him where I'd clean, I'd sweep, I'd do whatever in exchange for accommodation. Then I started digging people's you know, compounds to get money to you know, look after myself. Then eventually I got a, pl a place in a, second, in a secondary school. Uh, I think, I believe it was Old Kampara. I don't know whether it's still there. Mm. But I would dig for a living. I would dig, I would clean for a living. And then eventually I started asking people if I could put beans and maize into the field, into the fields or the gardens or the compounds. And they accepted. And from the harvest of the beans and the compounds, I then started selling bananas by the side of the road. I went to the market. And eventually, I started offloading big matoki from the trucks. At the same time, I was you were uh, you were a young entrepreneur. I was. As, I even bought a dealership in the sale of Obshera, you know, from uh, as well in, uh, as uh, you know, somewhere in uh, in Mulago Slam. You know, there was a big sister from Kabari. She was called Nyamhango. I hope she's still living. And mm. I bought a dealership. So I uh, I I I came from. Very humble beginnings in, in Kampala I yes. came from the lowest of the law you know to reach a stage where I could uh, I, I could support myself what did you do from there what 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 other major thing did you do nothing uh, major because I was the most brainwashed person uh, mm. that you could come across um, I uh, when I was doing my high school I took a teaching job in a secondary school I think it was called Namugongo Mm. Uh, and we turned it around. I had another gent brother called Ofundi, and uh, we found a school that had never qualified any student, had never done anything, uh, and we turned it around to become one of the best schools. You know, by the time I left, I was only there for a year or something. Then uh, I was also in high school, I was one of the greatest debaters. I remember in seminars, if mm. I didn't come, into a seminar, nobody, it wouldn't start. It would not, so in Nabingo, Namiriango, Nabisunga. No Kaihura, no, uh, no, no lecture, yes, no seminar. I was called Kaihura Kuba at the time, it was called Nkamhayo, you know. So Nkamhayo. Kaihura, it was a name I was given at childhood, but I thought it was too strong and too mm -hmm. big. Eh? Uh, I, mm. I took it on in, uh, in, in the 90s, you know, that's when, when I... You when you realized you that you were now strong, and you... <laughs> very good. So, uh, I also did a stint at Radio Uganda and, uh, and, and uh, Uganda Television, and I, I worked uh, as a presenter, uh, doing documentaries, and uh, it was actually my work in the radio uh, in, that also caused me problems, because I interviewed... Uh, at the time when Museveni was in the bush, I interviewed some of the rebels, and that brought a lot of wrath with, uh, you know, the then president. So you didn't they get to... Truck, uh, to, to uh, they sent soldiers, they arrested me, they put me in uh, Nile mansions, um, I th uh, which is now Nile... Uh, what's Serena it? Hotel. Serena Hotel. And I jumped mm. off the second floor, uh, room I think it was 305, room 305. Mm. I jumped off landed in the garden remember i tell you i was very acrobatic and mm, very strong so art and very strong i hid in the flowers and uh, i escaped and uh, you know so eventually i ended up in england wow yes. that's a massive leap
from Kampala to England. Tell me, tell me, tell me about that. What were your first impressions of England? I had gone to give a lecture to Bradford. Bradford uh, invited at Bradford University to give a lecture on the economic uh, uh, status of East Africa. So, when I got to Bradford... Let me ask you a question, sorry to interrupt you. Were you by then a graduate? Had you attended university in... No, no. In, I, had, in uh, I had not attended the university, you know, but I had worked in radio. And uh, I had some level of confidence. And, um, um, and I had got, I think, a diploma at uh, an institute, the, the Institute of Public Administration. Very good. So I believed in paper qualification. So when very they asked good. me to come and give a lecture at the university, I'm thinking, you know, but I'm not a professor, I'm not a whatever. So when I got in and I started talking about, when I got into Bradford, mm. I saw tiny little houses. Mm. Tiny, I first stayed in London in a two-bedroom apartment, uh, uh, terraced house. The, the, the apartment was the size of a kitchen where I was born. And uh, I then went to Bradford, and I saw small gardens, small houses. Um, and then I was staying in the house of a professor. So I'm thinking, if a professor has this kind of house, then what about the lecturers, and what about the students? So by the t and then there were a lot of fires in in uh, in that part of the world in Bradford. Mm. So when I went to give a lecture at this uh, university in Bradford, they asked me uh, and I was talking about how East Africa, how we are well, how we have food, how we have uh, you know aunties and uncles and you know how we celebrate Christmas and how you know we you know we come from where to do families and people started laughing and then thinking, you come from Africa, you you poor people. And uh, so one person stood up and says, these homes that you tell us that you have, are they not sharks, teen sharks? How can you think that that is the development? Hmm. Are they not, can't they catch fire in such a short time? So remember I told you I was very good at debating, you know, in mm. my school days. So. Uh, and I had never, you know, I remember uh, I'll come back to this, but I remember one time we were in a, in a school called Nabingo, and there was this brother from Chisubi, and uh, I was I had been asked to give a lecture as a student uh, on Buganda, and uh, and the thing was that before the coming of the Europeans, African societies were disorganized, mm. and me I was saying no, they were very organized, and I was talking about Buganda and how Buganda had laws, and one of the answers that I gave was that in Buganda, unsuccessful claimants to the throne would be killed, which ensured that there were no contestants to the throne. So mm. there were no, nobody would, uh, would, uh, would come to contest rivalries in terms of secession, secession disputes. So this brother stands and says, these laws, were they not so cruel and so barbaric? How can you say that it's a law that allows for the killing of your opponents? And I said, my brother, I was asked to debate the existence of laws, not how nefarious these laws were. You know? <laughs> I don't care whether they were humane or not. Uganda had laws. laws. They were published and well known that if they have the, the king is chosen, unsuccessful claimants would be put to death. You know, and every the room erupted. So this instinct <laughs> became, started coming back to me, and I said, if I could, you know, try this instinct on my own people. Why can't I try them on these Europeans? Remember at the time, I am the most brainwashed black person. I believe white people are gods and goddesses. But I have now entered the lion's den. And I have been in, in an area where these people live. People that we thought were rich. People we thought were, were endowed. People we thought had streets paved with gold. And I saw men standing by big, big oil drums with fire within it, war uh, warming their hands. And mm. I'm thinking, my God, they're not that uh, rich and they're not that wealthy. So what happens then? What happens is I stand up and I say to this man, I think both in, uh, in East Africa and in England, houses can catch fire. Actually, since I've been in Bradford, a couple of houses have caught fire if we are to believe the news. Mm. Now, we need to look at the position of the owner of the house after the fire. If you are living in Africa, you will make an alarm. People will come, they'll put the fire out. 
And if they can't rescue your house the following day, they will help you build another house. It could even be bigger than the house that you had. But if you are living in England and you had no insurance, you that will be it. on the street. You will be homeless. And by law, you can't sleep under the bridge or even steal bread. Mm. The whole hall erupted like this, saying, who is this man? Yeah. I'm thinking, my God, I have knocked out this one. Yeah. So they were so impressed by uh, my presentation. So they called me to go and give uh, another lecture. There was a professor from the University of uh, Sussex in Brighton, and he also called me to go and give a lecture. So I went to, the, to Sussex in Brighton. And then uh, I, I, I was, uh, while at Sussex in Brighton, they called me to give another lecture at the School of African Oriental Studies. Remember, these are, you know, places. Major uh, centers of learning. Uh, whatever yes. centers of learning. And by that time, I had really begun slowly to adjust to the fact that white people are not rich, that they are not wealthy, that they are not so well to do, you know, that they are, they are not uh, as what we thought they were so i'm going now to these um many universities and i'm giving a lecture here and i'm giving a lecture there and eventually they ask me to go to you know uh you know bbc world service and uh, bush house you know? remember you grow up in africa and you are listening to bbc bbc this is bbc world service and and uh, hilton fire and and you're thinking bush house bush house so eventually I go to BBC and I reach a bush house. Yes, it's a tall building. And Network Africa is just a small room. And I'm thinking, oh, oh where is uh, Hilton Fire? And they say he's seated there. Uh, where is Carolyn Dempster? And they say he's seated there. I'm thinking that this is like a megalithic you know, house with thousands of employees and and I'm looking at this one room that has so much influence on Africa. You know, people reporting about Africa from far, from very far. You know, and I'm thinking, this is unacceptable. This is unbelievable. You know, and I said to myself, I needed to study, really. Uh, you know, uh, you know, broadcast journalism. I needed to study radio and television, which I was in, because I am looking at where the power in Africa is coming from. You know, there are African people now on the continent that listen to BBC 24 hours, that believe if you hear something on the BBC, it is true. You know, and I wanted to get in the BBC to see where do they get that truth from? How do they construct it? Is it really true? You know, and I think it was just lo looking at that, that city um, room, you know, that was BBC Network Africa. And, the, and, you know, those, you know, white people that sat there pretending like they knew everything about Africa and calling up leaders and, and uh, asking them this question and that question and leaders giving the answers and influencing really the destiny of the whole continent. That more and more gave me that appetite, you know, to want to know more. You know, at the same time, I was also um, l listening and learning and watching this transition, the transition of Africa, of, of my own transition, you know, from being this miseducated, brainwashed, you know, African. Because I was the most brainwashed. I was the most miseducated. But slowly and carefully, I started piecing the whole story together. And I started seeing myself as an equal uh, or somewhere close, you know, to being an equal because I am thinking that uh, there is something that has been missed. England taught me at that stage my first shock that people in England are poor. The majority of the people are poor. They might have what looks like great wealth that they have attained from everybody, but they are poor. The second thing it taught me was that a small group of people in one room with a megaphone, i.e. radio, or television, can influence the destiny of a continent, just like Network Africa. And third, it taught me that really, as an African, I wasn't that... I was better off than most of these white people. And so, when I eventually go to study in England, my choice is 
to study television and to study radio and to study strategic communication. So when did you become really aware of your, your blackness, as I would say? When I was studying for a master's degree in communication studies, uh, communication design it was called. And I must say this early that I am somebody who does not believe in formal European education. I do not believe that my master my former slave master can really qualify me to hold office and he can teach me anything of great benefit to my race. Because the intention of a colonizer is to colonize, to dominate. When you the, say your slave master um, cannot teach you, are you saying the entire um, Caucasian race or are you, are you saying those um, aristocrats, those people who benefited. Well, the, the education system was not designed by the entire Caucasian race. Very but good. it is also true that the entire Caucasian race participated in our enslavement, I enjoyed our enslavement, benefited from the, our enslavement some would argue, up to today. Some would argue that during slavery, especially up to the last hundred years of it, poverty in England, especially in London, was at its peak. There was serious poverty in England. Yes, because that time and, and capitalism didn't benefit from capitali slavery. But at that time, capitalism had begun to consolidate itself with the wealth now flowing into the hands of a few people, uh, particularly bankers. You know what we call banksters. Mm. You know Cecil Rhodes amassing all this wealth and setting up the Knights of the Round Table. You know the Round Table now controlling financial institutions of the world and gold moving into the hands of a few. I, I, so I, most of these central banks set up after England and taking their cue, you know, from Britain. But the wealth is not in the hands of the majority because their absolutely. intention is not a dis distribution. The intention is ab obscene acquisition in the hands of a few. Of a few. So that is, remember that the wealth, if it is in the hands of everybody, Everybody will want a stake in what happens in their country. Mm. They will want to decide what happens to their country. Mm. They can't be bought. And if you look at how systems and states acquire uh, cons uh, consent, they can acquire it either by propaganda, ideology, or they can acquire it by force or by purchase. They can purchase your consent by giving you money, you know, to say, come and work for us and don't ask any questions as mm. long as you are receiving a salary. They can purchase it by a gun, you know, saying you come in the street, we will beat you, so stay away. Uh, or they can uh, do it by ideology, telling you Britain is best. So if you have the best shoes, you know, they, can, they are clerks. You know, the best, uh, you know, radio is from Japan. You know, the best, uh, um, you know, transmitter is Marconi. So. You know, the best suit, you know, is, uh, I don't wear European clothes, but I'm sure they have somebody where they say the best suit is from, you know, this, uh, you know, this person. Now, I am studying for a master's degree. And you remember they call it a master's degree because they are seeing you who is receiving it as a slave. That's where it comes from, a master's degree. The master gives you the degree to confirm you as a slave. And everything that you write, the master must know. You must quote the master. You mm. must echo the master. You must mimic the master. Mm. And that is why I have no interest in flagging any of all those documents that I got from, you know, white people. Do you not have a form. master's degree? I do not have. Uh, I got the paper, you know, but I don't flash it. I don't want to recognize it. Did you I attend a graduation want, ceremony? I did not attend a graduation <laughs> ceremony. I had a picture, you know, just in case somebody stands up and says, uh, you know, you're doing this because you don't have it. It was a formality, but I was going through transition. So when I am uh, doing my master's degree, I am sent to, to this news in London, you know, to look at the images that have come from Africa. From, from East Africa, from 1962 to 1984. Uh, this news supplied most of the pictures. It has now been bought by Reuters. And just as I am looking at these images, I stumble, quite by chance, on the civil rights movement uh, in America with Dr. Martin Luther King. And I saw these black people who looked like me and they had been, and they had water cannons on them, and they had dogs on them, and they were beating them, and they were imprisoning them. And they looked at people from my village. And I said to myself, my God, these are people from my village. Why are they beating them? 
Why are they enslaving them? Why are they treating them in this way and in this fashion? And uh, I started reading about Martin Luther King, and then I started reading about Mark Martin Luther King led me to Malcolm X, and Malcolm X said to me uh, in his autobiography that the logic of the oppressed cannot be the same as the logic of the oppressor. Not if the oppressed want to be free, because the cutness of the logic of the cat can't be as the logic of the rat. As I always say in my lectures, the cutness of the cat is in catching a rat. So I went back, turned now, switched on. And I started reading some of the books that Malcolm X recommended, that Martin Luther King recommended. I went to a library. I don't know whether I still remember the name. Canford Audio Library got most of uh, Martin Luther King's speeches. They didn't have Malcolm X's speeches. Um, so I remained Mr. In-Between, as Malcolm X would call it. Uh, with one foot in the world, uh, listening to you know to to to, to you know to, to Tarkovsky and uh, and and uh, and um, Mozart, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus mm -hmm. Mozart, and mm -hmm. you know and uh, attending the opera and wow. you know and holding glasses to see the opera singer and the Pirates of Penzance and you know the Prince of Wales is on my thread, but that gives me no hope because I'm a white girl on dope. That's from the Pirates of Penzance. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I am beginning to think, my God, I'm a black person. I am an African person. Mm. I am somebody who has a history. And remember, I had had girlfriends from America, white girlfriends. I had had girlfriends in England. Nine of them told me there was more than 30 million African people in America. Nine of them told me, um, you know, there were African people in the Caribbean. We had studied them as slaves, but... You know, what did it matter? You know, they were just slaves. It was as though they disappeared, you know, uh, you know, in that period. So I felt betrayed by the education system I had gone through, by all these friends. None of them sat me down to say, by the way, do you know you are an African? Why so, should they? Well, at the time I felt it was like their the duty to tell me the truth by the silly BBC that I used to listen to, BBC World Service. Hilton Fire was a black person like me. He never told me anything about Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. He never told me about the rich history that we had. So, but I remained there. So one time when I'm studying for a PhD in Leeds, I am seated in this train going to Leeds. I am doing a documentary for Leeds City Council. I am wearing a suit, you know, a white shirt, you know, with a red collar. I have a nice necktie. I'm a bad man holding a briefcase, you know. Mm -hmm. So this coarse Jamaican comes and sits near me in the train. And he has, begins a conversation in the Jamaican patois asked me where I was going. And I said to him, I'm going to Leeds. I am studying for a PhD in communication studies. And he says to me, you must be a fool. And I had learned all these English expressions. You know, I had lived in Manchester now for a long time. So I stand and look at him and I say, excuse me? I didn't say, why did you call me a fool? You know, do, do I look like a fool? That's what a black person would say. You know, but excuse me? And he says, you're a fool. And I said, so you are an idiot. How come? <laughs> yes, that's like he said it like this. <laughs> say patwa in patwa. How would you say you are a fool? <laughs> you are an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, as he says to, he, to me, how can you come from? No, he says to me, if you want to study a desert, you go to the Sahara. Mm. And I said, yes. And he says, you can't study desert by looking at the marital relationship of fish. And I said, yes. And I said, how you come from Africa, you know, to study communication from them people? Them can talk. Mm. And you know, they are all holding newspapers in the train trying to say, these black people are beginning to kick something. You know, we could have some free video. But others were edging away from us. Two black men having a philosophical conversation. And I'm saying, and he says, who is your professor? My professor was a white man from South Africa. Well, he knew South Africa from the Boer's point of view. Absolutely. My, my, uh, my uh, tutor was from Canada. He never even been to Africa. So when I told him this, he started laughing at me. Yeah. Now, when I, that time, I was going to film in a place called Scanthorpe. Scanthorpe mm -hmm. is near York. Mm -hmm. And 
I was interviewing and filming and it got late and I was alone at the train station and I said to myself, I could die here and nobody would know. 11 o'clock, a black person, the train station didn't even have any lights. It didn't have a screen that tells you what time a, plane was, a train was coming. And if the train didn't come, I was going to go in the bushes and sleep there. I was not going to go, you know, walking alone in uh, Scanthorpe. Even the name Scanthorpe. Can you imagine me in Scanthorpe? Not in, uh, not in Imbale, not in Tororo, not in uh, Konakamdini, no not, in Juba, not in Juba, not in Kinshasa, <laughs> not in Brazil. I am in Scanthorpe. Scanthorpe. Mm. Yeah? I am in Cordadale. I am in Halifax. I am in New York. I am in Yorkshire and Humberside. When I left that time and I got home, I looked at all the books that I had in my library, all written by white people. And I remembered what Marco X had said, the logic of the oppressed cannot be the same as the logic of the oppressor. So I got these books, piled them up in a box. And I didn't want to display them in my bookshop. And I, det I was determined from that time that I would seek the knowledge of Africa. That I would seek my knowledge. I seek to know myself. What is it? Where did I? How did I end up here? Who are we before white people came to Africa? Is, uh, this, is this the time that you decided uh, to dedicate your life to the struggle of, uh, let me say, African liberation? No. That was not the time. This is the time when I, did it, I decided to study about my people and my race. This is the time when I realized that all the knowledge that I had picked up in all these primary schools and all these high schools, that the mm -hmm. only legitimate knowledge that mattered was when I learned how to grow potatoes and grow yams and grow sugarcane. Mm -hmm. That's when I learned how to know what you know, tobacco is and what matoke is and how to grow cassava that the rest of the knowledge me studying St. Lawrence Seaway and, and the South Cotton Belt and freaking New York that that was not education that was purely miseducation so I sought to go under the master teacher system to learn about myself I sought to get a teacher because I couldn't teach myself about what I didn't know I realized I didn't know myself. Even a coarse Jamaican with big boots, you know, with some smelly clothes and a beard that had some ganja in it, yeah, could throw some philosophy that I couldn't answer to. He asked me a question that I couldn't answer. He told me I was a fool. And for the first time in my life, I realized. So it took a Jamaican all the way from the Caribbean yes. to tell an African. Yes. Um, in London, my friend, <laughs> that he was a the fool. Caribbean island has been famous for creating men bigger than the island that produced them. I am sure you know Munro Trotter. I'm I am sure Trotter. you know Delaney, the brother who coined the expression Africa for the Africans. Africans. And Marcus Garvey would add those at home and those, and those, at, abroad. And those abroad. Even Louis Farrakhan comes from mm. the Caribbean. Mm. You know, even Malcolm X's mother came from Grenada. Colin you know, Powell. Colin Powell came from, So the Jamaican island has produced Tusa Lanvetua. But at that time, if you had asked me Tusa, <laughs> I don't even know who are we talking who Tusa about. Huawei. Tell us about the master servant, uh, master, master student system. Master student system is an apprentice system where a person agrees to choose a teacher and to abide by what the teacher tells them to do everything, to do chores around the house, to cook for the teacher, to wash his feet, even clean his teeth, should he ask you to wash his clothes and iron them to run errands, to be an apprentice in exchange for knowledge and information. So at first time you were a student to the white system, what, could I say that? Well, at first time I was a student to the white system and I paid, you know, the teachers, but they were not master teachers because a master teacher opens your third eye. He teaches you how to have a holistic view. He teaches you how to see the whole world as it really is. He picks you when you are upside down. He restores you right side up. Mm -hmm.